Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. I have really been looking forward to this lecture, and I hope you have too. Um, I saw Adams written up in Tucson Lifestyles magazine with some images of the images that he'd taken, and I was thought it was stunning. It would be very interesting to learn more about how he captures those images. Adam Block, our speaker tonight, is the founder of the Mountain Lemon Sky Center, which I hope we can do a field trip to at some point. And he's a researcher at the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona. In 1912, he was awarded the Hubble Award for in recognition of the many remarkable... What? <laughs> 2012. 2000. That was my mistake. It's just one of many tonight. In 2012, he got a, an award, a big award, um, recognizing te techniques he has developed for processing celestial images and for his outreach programs, which have helped popularize astronomy. Um, he has an asteroid named after him uh, because he's done research in locations of asteroids. We've had uh, a lecture from somebody on the Sky Search a couple months ago, so we know a little bit about that. And his photographs have been in Astronomy Magazine, Sky and Telescope, National Geographic, Scientific American, and uh, this is French, L'Astronomie. <laughs> and over 90 times he has had his picture featured as the NASA astronomy picture of the day. Those are really impressive credentials. And I look forward to hearing how um, Adam has managed to achieve all this, the techniques of the art of astrophotography and the images that he's been able to capture. Thank you so much for coming, Adam. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so just on a technical note, first of all, can everyone in the room hear me? Yeah, okay. This is the first time in maybe a couple of years that I've spoken in person. So uh, maybe I'm a little rusty, but we'll see what happens. If on a technical side there is an issue, feel free to stop me and we'll fix whatever the issue is. So thank you very much for inviting me to this presentation, to give this presentation. Hold on, let me find the clicker. Can you? There it is. I'm going to try to use it. I title this talk, Ancient Echoes of a Forgotten Sky. And the genesis of this talk comes from a sandwich shop where I was sitting and finishing my meal when a server came over to me and without saying anything at all, just pointed at the table. And I quote, said the following, he said, that's sick, is it real? Now I'm in an establishment that is serving food. That might be an unexpected thing to have said. But in this case, it's not a bad thing. Sick in this parlance actually is a good thing. And depending upon the decade that you hail from will determine the synonym that is like it. So if you come from the 40s, you might have called it the bee's knees. In the 70s, it could have been gnarly or rad. Sick makes its first appearance in the 80s. And I guess it has a, res a resurgence maybe 35 years later when I was having this meal at a sandwich shop. Uh, by the way, just as a public service announcement, do not use this word now. Today, it's a different word. It might be a word like lit or something like that. So just in case you need to use these words, to use the right one. And what he was looking at on top of the table was an image like this. It happened to have been one of my astro photographs. And the purpose of this talk then is to really address the two parts of his sentiment. One part is the realness of the image. Is that real? And I'd like to discuss the interpretation of the image. What are the attributes that you can look for in these images? Uh, astronomical images are a little bit challenging when it comes to understanding and interpreting what it is that you're looking at. And then the second part is, of course, the compelling nature of the images, astronomical images, and in particular, images of the night sky. There is something very special, I think, about that idea. Had the pictures on the tabletop been pictures of a beach or elephants, or I don't know, pick your choice, 
I don't think there would have been a similar reaction. But because this was space imagery, it generated a very excited reaction from this individual. This object is the Horsehead Nebula. It's a really beautiful nebula of glowing hydrogen gas, and it has a dark dust cloud in it and so on. So I'll show you more about this in just a moment. But in terms of attributes of images, there are a number of things that are basically kind of like the information content where we have the field of view, how much of the sky is being captured in the image. You have the resolution, which would be the detail of the image, and then the color. And I'll have to spend a few more minutes to talk a little bit about coloring images because there is some complexity with regards to that. Uh, and so here is a picture that is a uh, wide field of view image that I took from the Mount Lemmon Sky Center. This is just over a wintry scene, just over the Learning Center where I, I used to work there. And I used just a tripod with a regular camera. So you can see the building and then above in the sky, hopefully what is a familiar pattern, which is the constellation of Orion. So if I put my mouse here, you can see two bright stars here, which are the shoulder stars of Orion with a pinchy little head between. This is Betelgeuse, don't say it more than three times, I guess. Down here are his knees or his feet, depending upon how tall you make the guy. And most famously are three stars in a row here, the belt stars of Orion, the three that hold up his pants. Just down and to the right, there is yet a little more where he might have a sheath to store his sword. It is also the location of the Orion Nebula. So in the next image, I'd like to show you just that region of the sky. And instead of using a camera on a tripod, now it's a small telescope. And this is the view that you get. It's rotated a little bit, but if you look closely, you'll be able to identify one, two, three stars. These three are the belt stars of Orion. And upon closer inspection, you may see right there is a little tiny horse head. So the image that I showed you first was an image taken with a very large telescope. But here is a small telescope, and you get a much larger field of view, a much larger piece of the sky. And over up and to the right is all of that comprises that little area that was the sheath. It is the Great Orion Nebula. And I'm circling just a small portion of it because that's what I'm going to zoom into next using uh, a picture that I generated with a much larger telescope, the Schulman Telescope at the Mount Lemmon Sky Center. So here is an image of just that portion of the nebula. We're not looking at as much of the field of view, but you can see uh, much more detail. Uh, the stars are sharper and much more contrast in the image. In fact, if we were to do this experiment where we take the small telescope image and enlarge it to be the same scale as the intrinsic scale that I did with the larger telescope on the left, you can see that there is a, a striking difference between the two. There is much greater resolution, sharpness, and clarity, the image on the left compared to the image on the right. That's what bigger telescopes can gain you in many um, instances. In fact, what is on the left is not the full resolution, intrinsic scale of the uh, telescope plus sensor I was using. This is actually closer to that true scale where I can't even fit on the monitor the entire picture. I'd have to scroll around. So I'm just showing you uh, a small portion of that field of view. In fact, one of the funny things is about uh, amateur astronomers when they post their images on the internet, sometimes they'll take a picture of the Whirlpool Galaxy. And then when they want to show everyone, they also put side by side a picture uh, taken, say, with the Hubble Space Telescope, a space-based image of the same object, the Whirlpool Galaxy. But what they've done is they've taken this huge image taken by HST and shrunk it down so they can fit both their image and the HST image on the screen. That's very unfair. Now, that doesn't truly show this difference in resolution. Yes, they're going to look similar because you took the image and you shrunk it down. But if you did the inverse and you showed the HST image at its intrinsic resolution and then enlarged the earthbound you know, amateur telescope image, it would look very, very fuzzy by comparison. So space-based uh, imagery uh, and what professionals are doing with HST and now uh, James Webb Telescope, the JWST Telescope, is remarkable. Whenever you take pictures, of course, there is also a, an appreciation of the certain kinds of 
artifacts. There are always artifacts in images. And again, with astronomical images, that can be hard to identify. Certainly one of the most prominent things that people are usually captivated by are the diffraction patterns of stars. You'll see the beautiful plus sign around the bright stars here. And that is part and parcel to the design of the telescope. Uh, telescopes, uh, the kind that is used here to generate this image, generally there are multiple mirrors and the, main, uh, the secondary mirror that's at the front of the telescope is held in place by four veins or support rods, some structure. So as the light passes uh, through it and to the primary mirror, it will be diffracted, scattered. And you get this kind of pattern on every star. It just shows up most prominently on the brightest stars, but every star, every formed image here has that, and it is an artifact. Now, the funny thing about it is that with the advent of film and used in astronomy with big, large professional telescopes, they were already of the design that had the support structures. And right from the beginning, we're making this diffraction pattern, you know, almost a hundred years ago now, so that there is almost an expectation that a lot of people, the public and artists and everyone has that stars should have this, you know, this pattern, this plus, but it is an artifact of the instrumentation, not uh, a beauty thing to look for in space. The stars don't really have that. In fact, this is actually the diffraction pattern of the James Webb Space Space Telescope. So it doesn't have a support structure in the same way, but it is a very complex optical design with multiple mirrors and very sophisticated instrumentation so that the diffraction pattern of stars looks like a snowflake. If you zoom into them, this is what every formed image at JWST basically looks like, which is kind of cool. And then the big attribute to really kind of talk about for a moment are the colors of these astronomical images. We, of course, enjoy and are biased towards the visible wavelengths of light, those wavelengths of light that we can perceive with our eyes. Those are the wavelengths we get to sense, but there is a very large, of course, spectrum of wavelengths of light that we don't sense with our eyes. There is nothing in particular that is special about the wavelengths that we see when it comes to the physics of the universe. So if you want to understand the universe at a very deep level, you wouldn't just want to look at the visible wavelengths. You want to examine the universe in everything from gamma rays through radio wavelengths of light. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be concentrating on the visible wavelengths of light for these pretty pictures because I'm using a camera that looks something like this to generate the images. This is very similar. This is like an amateur CCD camera, the kind that you would attach to the back of a telescope, but it detects the same wavelengths of light that you would if you had a, a just a digital commercial available uh, you know, camera and you take pictures of your friends with. This is really no different it's just optimized in a number of ways. It's a little more sensitive and you can cool it and do some other things with it. But all in all, very, very similar in the way in which you would use it to generate images using visible light. So the example that I've already shown you and I'll show you some more here are examples of what I call broadband imaging. The thing about these cameras and these detectors is that, and this is true of any sensor, they don't automatically discriminate in the different wavelengths of light. These sensors, the only thing they do is they count light, one photon, two photons, and so on, so that when you get the data on the computer, you're looking at an intensity of the amount of light. If you want to distinguish between the different wavelengths of light that were incident on the sensor, then you need to put a filter, a piece of glass in front of the sensor, and thereby let only particular wavelengths of light that you know that their color come through. So when you're doing broadband imaging, you use these very large buckets of light. You have a, a red filter that lets through not a single color, but many reddish color wavelengths of light, a third of the spectrum. And then you have a greenish filter. You would take another picture with it and another picture with a blue filter in front of the sensor. You'll have three grayscale images on your computer, but then you combine them. You associate them with these color channels and you make a color picture. If the object does not have blue being emitted in it, then it doesn't show up in your blue image. And then when you combine it together, you don't have blue in the final result. So there isn't a choice. I mean, you can obviously make things whatever color you want, 
But if you're doing this in a strictly um, combinatorial uh, by combining the data, you know, just to create a color picture, this is going to be a representation of the amount of light that you detected in each color in the visible wavelengths. Now, when astronomers make these measurements, however, they're not going to do, in general, broadband imaging because it's not precise enough. If you want to make a measurement and understand the astrophysics of what you're observing, be it galaxies or nebula, you're going to want to focus in on particular wavelengths of light that are astrophysically interesting. So they do narrow band imaging. Their filters only let through very small amounts of particular wavelengths of light. You could, however, take this scientific data and create a picture. Now, you, astronomers don't in general create pretty pictures. It's the measurement, the quantifiable information that's of interest. But you could make an image out of this information, and it could be of the actual colors that you have you know, truly captured there. But by doing so and not including all the intermediate colors, you're not going to get something that looks like a broadband image. And uh, it depends a little bit on, you know, what photons of light the particular object is emitting and so on. So this is an example of a broadband image. This is the very famous nebula called the Eagle Nebula. It is forming stars. You can even see kind of a star cluster. Oh, sorry. A star, ah, stop that. A star cluster right here that has started to form and it's blowing away those clouds of gas and dust. The three finger-like projections there, those are called the pillars of the Eagle Nebula. And now I'll show you the picture. This is the same thing. This is the Hubble Space Telescope image of the same. And it has a much greater resolution. Now I'm not gonna show you the full resolution. It would more than fill this uh, screen. But what I wanted to point out is that when they took the data, they were observing one, greenish wavelength of light that is somewhere over, where's my mouse? Somewhere here. And then they observe two red wavelengths of light. Now, if you actually took those true colors and combined them together to make a color picture, it would make a green red mess. It wouldn't look very good. So they remapped those colors as red, green, and blue arbitrarily and created the picture that you see. Because the green one corresponds to the wavelengths of light that the hydrogen gas in this nebula is glowing. And you can see, you can tell what color it glows most strongly at. Look at the broadband image. It is mostly red. Red and pink is that color from my broadband image. But when you map it as green, your image then is going to be dominated by green. I actually don't like that palette. I don't like green in my images. There's something about that I don't like. But you can choose a different palette. You can make the hydrogen, instead of being green, you can choose another palette and perhaps making, uh, make something more palatable. I don't know. So what I've shown you so far are examples of visible wavelengths of light. But what's in the news today is, of course, all of the discoveries that are being made with the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is some data, recent data that's been released of discoveries from JWST. This is an image of the disk of material that is surrounding a very bright star. It's a well-known star in the sky, Fulmulhawk. Uh, you can step outside and see it with your eyes. It's one of the brighter stars in the sky. And with JWST taking a picture of this, these features that you're seeing in the disk are completely new discoveries. I'll show you in a moment what was um, able to be observed prior to this time. It's really remarkable. But the disk itself is, has this structure very likely because of planets being inside. That inner ring and those gaps, those ring-like structures there are somehow enhancements in the material that is surrounding the star, probably being guided by more massive things like planets. So we can't see the planets directly but stay tuned, it's very likely that eventually planets will be discovered here. Here on the left is the release of the image done by the Space Science uh, Institute. So the image that I created, I had this fantastic opportunity to work with the astronomers that actually wrote the paper about these discoveries. And they asked me to join them and work with the data to produce an image that the University of Arizona would release, and that's the image on the right that I made. The image on the left is the one that the Space Science Institute made. It's okay, 
but it's very much like the conservative way that uh, it's typically done where they're not gonna go for the highest contrast. You'll notice that their ring here corresponds to only a fraction. So this ring here is the same as this part here. So that, you know, in my mind, they're not showing the whole disc, they don't show the contrast and they don't remove the artifact of the central kind of saturation in there. So I chose to process the image differently um, in order to communicate what I think is the interesting story of this particular object. Now, the whole thing about this is that it's not invisible light. This is all in infrared light. We can't see these kinds of features with our eyes, but using the instrumentation on JWST, you can. One final mapping that was really kind of cool, and this is what I was talking about. You'll notice here that there are these rings, these uh, ring-like features here. That's all that uh, HST using visible light was able to see of this entire disk. And the same is true for Alma. So for the past 20 whatever years, these were the features that were known about the formal hot system. And then I superimposed them, I composited them with the JWST data to say more about the story of what's going on here. I would encourage you to read the press release on this object. Really, really cool stuff. So now to think about the realness. I'm going to address that part of, you know, is it real? Yes, the answer is it's real. When we, <laughs> when we take pictures like this, especially broadband images like this, I am not choosing that some part of the nebula be blue or green or yellow or whatever it might be. Now, if you look through a telescope with your eye at this object, you would not see these colors. And that's a, of, some con, uh, of some concern for people because then the reality of it, it seems as though that it's not real because you can't see it biologically. But in some way, I would actually turn the equation around. People often you know, look at an image like this and they would say, well, this looks like it's enhanced. And I would turn it around and say, no, not really. In the sense that when we look through the telescope, those wavelengths of light, yellow and pink and blue, they are going through the telescope and they hit your eye. Now, the fact that there's not enough light for your eye to be, to be able to perceive those colors is not kind of a universe problem, that's an eyeball problem. So it isn't that this is an enhanced image, it is that our view is diminished by looking with biological eyes. This, in my mind, is a better representation of what is really there. Um, and on that note, you can, extend that a bit further. In terms of science, especially astronomy and many other sciences, when we have these instruments like these very sensitive cameras, they become our surrogate senses. They are the ways in which we're able to understand the universe around us. So there are many things beyond our ability to sense biologically, but that doesn't mean that stuff isn't real. It certainly is. Now, the other part of the sentiment was that it was sick or cool or whatever the word might be, that the image had some kind of compelling nature to it. And I agree, but long ago, I asked myself why. One of the things that I have been uh, really privileged, honored and uh, you know, just totally excited to be able to have been done, uh, that I've been able to do in my life is to be with people at a telescope and share in that experience of them looking through a telescope. Thousands, probably 100,000 people. I don't know how many people, but a lot of people. Uh, the same is true for workshops. There are workshops that I've given in astrophotography and working with people, working with astronomical data, especially people that are just starting to do this as beginners. And those experiences really taught me a lot about basically human nature and human response to seeing light at low light levels, to working with astronomical data and so on. And that lends itself to this compelling nature, what I think makes the compelling nature of these kinds of images. This would be my quintessential, my archetypal picture of a night sky. This picture actually is printed in a book called uh, Burnham's Celestial Handbook. It's a book that I read as a child. And I call it kind of archetypal because it's a picture of a starry sky. It has something about the earth in it. We have, we're looking through trees. It doesn't have any color when you're looking 
at the night sky just out there, there's not a whole lot of color going on. And there is a cluster in here. The, the blob of stars there is the Pleiades or the seven sisters, but in this photograph, you can see many more than seven. Let me show you a picture of the same that I took, again, using a small telescope and a long exposure you can see that this cluster now becomes a beautiful tapestry of color and light. We have clouds of dust that are scattering bluish light. We also have a little bit of emission of some hydrogen gas glowing that pink color. Uh, it's a wonderful piece of sky. But one of the things that I want to try to persuade you is that there exist preferences that people have that are shared by everyone that are cross-culturally shared. And this is a very interesting example I'm going to be getting into here, which deals with a kind of beauty. What I did, and I wanted to kind of make this an up-to-date presentation, is I went online and these big AI chatbot things are the, all the rage now. So I went in and I spoke to Bing or Dolly here. And I, I sorry, I'm getting it wrong, Dolly. I, better say the right one. <clears throat> and I put in three words. I said, please show me a beautiful landscape painting. That's it. That's all I told it. I didn't say what to put in the painting. I didn't say the color, the structures, nothing other than those three words. And this is what it comes back with. Now, of course, it is taking its cue from all of humanity's words about beauty and landscape and, you know, paintings and things like that. Then I asked it to do the next thing, beautiful landscape painting, cross-culturally shared. What does that look like? And this was the answer that it came back with. Basically, it similar kind of picture, but it added water and maybe a little person there doing something. So this is very interesting because there are preferred landscapes, which I found totally uh, surprising when I first learned about this. And I learned it from this particular gentleman. So this is Dennis Dutton. He was a philosopher of art and science. And he has a wonderful tech, TED talk that talks all about these kinds of preferences. I would highly, highly recommend to watch his TED talk, to read his book. It's super, super interesting, I think. I found a lot of inspiration from much of what he said. And in the next few slides, there are some people that I want to quote I can, of course, summarize what they said, but I think it's important to say their words because then you can get a really good sense of the way in which they mean it. So in this case, he has this theory of beauty. We can say that the experience of beauty is one of the ways in which evolution has of arousing and sustaining interest or fascination, even obsession, in order to encourage us to make the most adaptive decision for survival and reproduction. It is that these preferences that we have could be ancient echoes, ancient evolutionary echoes of a time that might be from our ancestors, perhaps two or three million years ago. And landscapes are just one of very many things. It could be the kind of food that we seek, like sugars and things like that. Um, uh, preferences that deal with performance, preferences, of course, that deal with art, and that's what he wrote a book about. But landscapes, crazy preference. And here's another picture that is this kind of Hudson uh, perfect uh, kind of portrait of a beautiful landscape that has the elements that you would expect, which include open spaces with low grass and groupings of trees, unobstructed view towards the horizon, low hanging branches, evidence of water, a path to follow, some animal or life and bird life, things like that. Why these things in particular? Well, a lot of these have evolutionary benefits. For example, the unobstructed view is because you want to be able to see far away in case there's anything that's going to be coming after you. Those low-hanging branches, if you need to scurry up a tree to get away from something, those are also very useful. Evidence of water, obvious, and animals as well. This scene is one that was sought out millions of years ago, perhaps during the Pleistocene, where our ancient ancestors two or three million years ago were running around on the African savanna. So that is the idea behind an ancient uh, echo that people seem to share this preference. People share this preference even if they don't live in places that look like this. We don't live in a place that looks like this. This is not the kind of Arizona 
is not the kind of place that you would seek out to, uh, you know, survive easily. Anyway, you would be severely challenged two or three million years ago in this kind of environment. There is another aspect of this, which I think is dealing with contrast. It's another evolutionary uh, strong preference that people have. I found it to be particularly true in astrophotography, but I wrote here that few things are more informative or compelling than contrast, the ability to be able to see the predator about to eat you, the signage on the roadway, the darkening clouds on the horizon could very well be important for your survival. And Ansel Adams certainly was a master of contrast. He, I believe, used this preference to his benefit to make images that people found compelling. There's no question that he is looked upon as someone who made very compelling images. And not only is the image on the bottom left here a contrast compelling kind of view, but it's also another special view. It's one that Carl Sagan chose to go aboard the Voyager spacecraft after it was done visiting the planets and leaving the solar system of all the landscape views that Carl Sagan could have chosen to represent, you know, a land beautiful landscape on the earth. That's the one he picked. He picked the Pleistocene view. He picked the archetypal landscape that I've been talking about. It's unfortunate. I never had a chance to, you know, to, he died before I had gotten into this, Dennis Dutton, but I think he would have, of course, not been surprised, but he might have found it interesting that Carl Sagan did make that pick. So in terms of a theory of beauty, again, I want to quote him, is beauty in the eye of the beholder? No, it's deep within our minds. It's a gift handed down from the intelligent skills and rich emotional lives of our most ancient ancestors, our powerful reaction to images, to the expression of emotion in art, to the beauty of music, and to the night sky will be with us for as long as we are around. And it's to the night sky, of course, that I get very excited because I think that it's true. There is something very compelling about the night sky. And I also think it's true that there is probably an evolutionary echo that is related to that fascination with space images and specifically with the night sky. But he doesn't answer the question as to why. And so that's where I'd like to continue here with a wonderful story. There was a story written by Isaac Asimov some time ago called Nightfall. And the way the story goes is that imagine that you were part of a civilization that lived in a place like this. This is called a, a globular star cluster, a ball of more than 100,000 stars. And you lived on a planet that orbited one of these stars in the cluster. It's very likely then that your sky would be filled not only with many stars, but you would probably be part of a multiple star system. So you would have many suns in your sky and probably would not see the night sky at all. So that's the setup for the story. But once every 500 years, there is the circumstance that all of these extra suns are below the horizon and the one that's above the horizon is eclipsed by the moon. And then that civilization for the first time in their lifetimes sees the rest of the universe. They see the night sky. And so what does Isaac Asimov say happens? Well, they go crazy. They, they literally kill themselves, civilization falls apart. And this apparently happens every 500 years because people can't figure out, the historians every 500 years can't figure out what keeps happening, that people see this night sky thing and, and destroy themselves. But that's basically the story. It's a short story. I'd highly recommend check it out. My point is that story does not work, cannot work, unless there is a kernel of truth to something about that feeling, that sublime feeling that people have with looking at the sky. It might seem like that's a perfectly reasonable story, but it's not. What if the grass disappeared today? Would have civilization fall down and you know whatever? No, there's something special about the night sky that makes that story work. So as an ancient echo then, the, the night sky is literally awesome. It has this quality of, you know, you admire the night sky, but also in some way being fearful. It's, it's, it has that element of fear and that's kind of that, again, sublime nature. Now what Carl Sagan wrote 
was the following. He said that before we invented civilization, our ancestors lived mainly in the open, out under the sky. And before we made light pollution and modern forms of nocturnal entertainment, we watched the stars. There were practical calendar considerations, of course, but there's something more than that. Even today, when the most jaded city dweller can be unexpectedly moved upon encountering a clear night sky studded with thousands of twinkling stars, when it happens to me after all these years, it still takes my breath away. Why? He doesn't answer that. He just takes it as a given. It takes my breath away. But I want to know why. So to continue, there is a cool word that means liking the night sky. A, a, a psychologist came up with this word, knocked Kailador. And according to his studies, he believed that the people that like the night sky seemed to be more open-minded and had other benefits. Apparently they were humble. Well, I have a high degree of knocked Kailadorosity, but I can't claim I have that low level of humbleness or whatever that is. I, you know, I'm showing off my pretty pictures here, right? Uh, and George Santayana, another philosopher, addressed another element of this. He too had this entire treatise on what makes the night sky very powerful. And there are elements that he talked about. But one of the things that he dismisses is this idea that before the days of Kepler, the heavens declared the glory of God. And we needed no calculation or stellar distances, no fancies about the plurality of worlds, no image of infinite spaces to make the stars sublime. It isn't that I tell you that the galaxy is 25 million light years away and the universe is 13 and a half billion years old and all of the facts, that's not it. You might think it's it in today's world where we get to really learn about planets that are orbiting Fomalhaut. But there's something more about the night sky that's compelling in its nature, and it's not the facts of it. So what is it? Well, one of the things that is very true that everyone shares is that when we go out to see the night sky, when we are in the dark, our bodies literally change. There is a visceral reaction to being out in the night. Our eyes produce a chemical called visual purple that increases the sensitivity of the cells of our eyes. Um, our other senses might be heightened because you know, we don't have very good nighttime vision. So maybe our sense of hearing is improved. We walk around slowly and carefully so we don't fall over things or whatever it is. Um, in fact, that, that fear response, that anxiety of being out in the night is a real thing. Uh, a scientist studied, it's not just the darkness, they studied whether it was just being put in the dark or whether it was actually the night that raised people's anxiety a little bit. And it turns out that it's the night, not the darkness. You can take people in a bright space, and if it is their circadian rhythm nighttime, then their level of, you know, quote unquote, anxiety or stress or whatever that you measure, that uh, kind of subconscious thing going on there, bodily reaction is happening with, in step with their circadian rhythm. And that's an ancient echo in and of itself. That's not something that you get to control. That just kind of happens. Uh, and so what you then have is a very particular kind of situation. You have a situation where people, imagine yourself two to three million years ago, out in the African savannah or wherever you are, your body and everything about survival is in this state of hypervigilance where you are trying to make sure that you're going to survive in these um, kind of hazardous conditions. So hypervigilance and curiosity set up a unique scenario in which our ancient ancestors were constantly in a state of heightened awareness of their surroundings in the dark, lest some creature, tribesman, or steep cliff do them harm. With our poor nighttime vision, then as now, what was seen? Nothing other than the brilliant starry sky splattered against the impenetrable opaqueness of the night. Would not seeing this deeply etched archetype, this universally human night sky scene, still echo the visceral and perceptual experiences of our evolutionary past? And I answer yes. I think that is the answer. I think that is the ancient echo 
that we still feel today. And I'd like to offer a little bit of evidence, if you will, for that idea. The night sky has features to it. One of the features it has are small stars. When you look at the night sky, the stars don't look very big, they're kind of small. Uh, it's dark between the stars, it's very high contrast. So you have, I wouldn't call it black, but very, very dark uh, compared to the brightness of the stars. High contrast. The ground is visible. We're surrounded by the ground when we look up. And then there are also the multitudes, the seeming countlessness of the stars. All of that together is a night sky and scene. And what I'm arguing is that the closer you uh, adhere to these features, the more preferable the astronomical scene typically is. So here's an example of uh, beginning astrophotographers. And I just gathered this image, not but a week and a half ago. So this goes on all the time for years and years. Everyone knows this that is in the field of astrophotography. It is that when you first start creating astronomical images, what often happens is you create an image and then you have to choose. You're always making choices and you have to choose among other things, how dark to make the sky. And inevitably, it always happens, the beginning astrophotographer always makes the sky very dark. Why? It could have been the other way. It could have been that the beginners, you know, randomly do sometimes too dark, too light. Or it could be that it's, you know, maybe it's less contrast and they don't know that they should really make it more and more contrast for their first images. It's never that. It is always black clipped. And in addition, always very high contrast as these images are. So these images are what many that are perhaps more experienced astrophotographers would say, that this is not necessarily the optimal way to represent the data. Of course, artistically, you can choose to do whatever you'd like. But there is more information in these images than is being displayed, both in color and brightness and tonal value and all that kind of stuff. And that's where the practice of doing astronomical imagery comes into place, uh, becomes something that's important. So that's a cool example. And I saw this all the time in workshops that I would give where the darkness of the sky becomes critical. And I'm saying that the reason for that being is that's what the night sky looks like. Another example is where these features of the sky become uh, something that you kind of look at in an image. On the left, we have, these are both images of the same object. This is the uh, Lagoon Nebula. On the left is a wide field view that shows almost the entire nebula. But then on the right, it's kind of more zoomed in just of that more central region uh, with a bigger telescope. And the thing is that the image on the left has more night sky-like features to it. It has those small stars. It has the darkness of the sky surrounding the object and the stars. It also has the appearance of that kind of level of contrast that you would think about when you think of the night sky. The image on the right doesn't have this. The image on the right has these larger stars, a magnified version of stars. And then of course, the details of the object are equally large and, um, and not something that you would normally find in the night sky. The point is that if you show these two pictures to someone who does not know anything about astronomy or astrophotography or anything like that. You just say, hey, these are pictures of space. Which one do you like? In general, the one on the left is going to be preferred. And I'm saying the reason it's preferred is because it has more of those features that are like the night sky. In fact, uh, the astronomy picture of the day is a site that I have been uh, you know, totally honored to have been uh, had images published on it uh, to show people. I mean, for me, it was a particular honor because one of the things that I did, I still do, are you know, forms of public outreach. And to have images published on the site means that I am reaching as far as I possibly can because Astronomy Picture of the Day is a very, very popular site. It is run by two astronomers. And many years ago, I very quickly determined, I've had enough images published there, that one of the two astronomers generally just didn't pick my images. Now I was picking, you know, I was generating images like what you see on the right. And I asked him one time, why? I sent him an email and he wrote back. 
And it was very great that he wrote back and I could understand his logic behind his aesthetics of what he was doing when he looked at an image. And uh, what is interesting is that it's kind of like the Dead Poet Society, uh, where you have the scene where the, the instructor is kind of trying to mathematically describe a poem or something like that. He did something kind of similar to that. Uh, his description was that when he looked at a scene that was an astrophotograph, he had a sense of what he called clarity. And he went on to describe what the clarity was. It had to do with the, the contrast of the image, how small the stars were compared to the size of the things within it, and so on. And what he was describing, what I now have been thinking about for a long time, was the night sky feature scene stuff. I think he was leaning into this ancient echo, this preference for those kinds of images, such that I would never be chosen according to his aesthetic because the images on the right just don't fit the bill. Uh, wide field images would because you would get these nice small stars. If you want small stars again, with these other features, well, space-based telescopes can do that because they have this, you know, they are above the blurring of the Earth's atmosphere. And now you have again pinpoint stars with beautiful objects and things like that. But this in-between, which is the space I was working in from the public outreach I was doing, just didn't quite fit his aesthetic. And so he didn't, but there were two astronomers. So luckily the other astronomer didn't have this, this same aesthetic. That was that's good. And an image like this, these are called nightscape images, where you have just, as I showed earlier, a camera on a tripod, you know, looking at the sky. And these, of course, have every possible, all of the, the possible features of the night sky, because now we have the actual ground with the sky, with small stars and everything else, right? And the reason I show you these images, and these are fantastic images by uh, Carrie Ann, who by the way, the middle image she just took last night. Uh, she, I asked her for permission and she told me she was in Chile uh, just right now. Uh, and she said, yeah, you can use the pictures that I had previously selected. And she said, well, I have this new one that I took. And so I'm showing you the new one with this very pretty picture. Uh, but these are images that if you ever put on a contest or something where you're you're trying to look at many different kinds of astronomical images uh, of you know, astrophotography, you would never mix nightscape images with telescope images in say like a competition of some sort because the nightscape images always win. They're always chosen by people who in particular don't know anything about astrophotography. If you just ask someone on the street, if you will, I'm putting in quotes on the street, which images look best to you? You know, you show them some beautiful, uh, you saw my Lagoon Nebula picture, right? And these pictures, they're going to pick these pictures. And I'm saying that is because it is this ancient echo of a forgotten sky. One more kind of night sky element that I, this is something that I use in astrophotography and other astrophotographers do as well. It's important to understand these preferences that people have as an artist. And I'm sure that all artists uh, appreciate this. I mean, everyone understands uh, the nature of complementary colors and certain kinds of structures and compositions are very important, right? It's kind of a sh one of these shared preferences. It doesn't mean you need to follow the shared preferences all the time. In fact, it'd be very uh, powerful to break the rule, if you will. But this is certainly an example that people will often take advantage of. This is what the scene of this nebula looks like without any adjustment. In order to display the nebula, the stars and their number become just so bright, it's almost a distraction. That isn't quite what the night sky looks like. If you instead shrink the stars and de-emphasize them just a little bit, you use deconvolution or a number of other techniques, then you get this. The stars are all there, but if you show just about anybody between these two versions of the image, this version here and this one here, people will usually pick this one. So amateur astronomers, astrophotographers, when they're processing their images, this is typically part of that workflow. And again, I'm gonna claim that this is one of those night sky-like elements that makes it preferentially a bit more compelling. Throughout the presentation, I've just been showing you mostly nebula because they've 
really been useful to what I was trying to describe. Of course, the universe is filled with lots of things. So just as a token galaxy right here at the end, let me show you the Whirlpool galaxy. I mentioned it earlier. This is the collision of two galaxies. And you can see that stars are being flung outwards. That's the hazy uh, kind of tails and things, uh, shells that are coming away from these galaxies. It looks fuzzy because we're so far away, we're just seeing the combined glow of all of these stars. But if I show you something closer to the full resolution, zoomed in a little bit on the left and zoomed in a little bit more, uh, closer to the intrinsic scale of what I captured the data at, you can really see, even with a small telescope, so I took these images again, right from Mount Lemmon, or I don't know what direction that is, but right from Mount Lemmon, I took these pictures. So imagine what you can do with a huge professional telescope or one that is in space, if this is what you can do with a ground-based telescope, uh, that might be akin to what amateur astronomers would have access to. And with that, I'm going to say that I, I had a chance to say everything I wanted to. So I very much appreciate you um, giving me that opportunity. Thank you. That was fascinating. I, I didn't know, know you were going to include so much aesthetics in this. In this one, well, I wanted very, to make very this interesting. A, different. Yeah. Um, now I'm going to ask everybody, if you have a question, please be patient while I get the microphone to you because we have people on assistive hearing devices. Why is it that so often when uh, there's a, a story about the stars in uh, the paper or magazine, the front page of the star last week, yeah. um, what you see is an artist rendering. Ah. Many things, as an example, um, there are discoveries that are being made about, let's say, planets that are orbiting other stars. The evidence for those planets comes not from a direct observation, but instead they are inferred by other means. For, as an example, stars, because if you have a planet orbiting it, a, a star literally wobbles gravitationally. Or the star's light might be eclipsed because something goes in front of it. You still can't see the planet, but you can infer that it's there. And you can measure its properties by the amount of light that the star dims or the degree to which the star moves. And from those properties, an artist can take the properties and say, OK, it's this mass, it's this far away from the sun or the star and so on and so forth and create an artist rendering, which is what you see. And that's much more interesting for someone who is going to read a paper about a discovery than just seeing a graph of the, you know, the numbers that might have been detected by the astronomer, yeah. Well, that was a color picture on the paper. Did you see it? I, I, I think that this is a common thing. I didn't see the one that you're referring to. But it is common for, uh, like in Astronomy Magazine, for example, they was, have renderings was, of all kinds of things that we just don't have pictures of yet. It was sort of green. Yeah. Would that be? I mean, well, how, artists how can cool. artists get to once you're outside of the parameters of what the astronomers have determined. If they want to make it a green planet, they can make it a green planet. I <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, you know die, take too much exactness into whatever the artist rendered. They are going to take. Um, artistic license, literally, when they make those images. Yeah. Two little things. One is, I'd wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about your asteroid. And the other is, how did you get into this field? Oh, uh, okay. So the asteroid is interesting. The interesting thing about asteroids is that if you want to find one, you can use a telescope and detect them and discover them. But the thing is that you don't name an asteroid that you have discovered after yourself. You name it after someone else. You want to honor someone else with the name. And I did discover an asteroid, but I didn't name it after myself. I named it after a, a, an astronomer that I knew growing up who was you know, inspirational for me. I actually went back to Georgia where I grew up and I presented him with the name of the asteroid. He was a very happy uh, professor. Yeah, he was a nice guy. Dr. Williman is his name. So the asteroid is called Williman. Someone honored me in a similar way. They discovered the asteroid. 
And they wanted to honor me because of my work in public outreach. And so there is an atom block asteroid up there as well. Uh, as far as my beginnings, my interest in astronomy began at the very earliest age. I don't know. I've always been interested in astronomy ever since the age of four or five or whatnot. I have a dim recollection of going on a walk with my grandfather who pointed at the sky, probably pointed at the moon. And, and I think that was it for me. So I, it's been my one thing in life is to be interested in astronomy. And I've just, I've always pursued it. Everyone that grew up around me in school, everyone knows it's Adam and astronomy. It's just, it's been my very dedicated uh, path in life. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much. This is so amazing. What a wonderful talk. Thanks. And these images are stunning. My question, I'm not exactly sure how to articulate it, but it has to do with how do you measure how old, you know, we are told you're, whatever image we get through the telescope is a, a look into the past. Right. And it's apparently measured by the number of light years from earth, but are they being tracked? How, how, can you just say a little something about how the images are determined, you know, what, what number of billions of years or whatever um, yeah. we're looking at? What is uh, kind of interesting is that I would start very, very close to home to answer this question because it's something that, you know, we, we, when we experience life, we don't think about it in these terms, but you can. When I am looking at you, you are some odd nanoseconds old, at least the light is that's being reflected off of you, that I see. So I am not seeing you as you are now. I am seeing you as you were some odd nanoseconds ago. Now, nanoseconds are very small, right? So it's not something I can perceive, but it is a true statement. When you get far enough away, of course, that difference in time certainly seems very significant. So as an example, uh, there is a, uh, a star that just blew up in a galaxy, and it's been in the news. Uh, it's uh, a famous galaxy called M101. You'll see lots of pictures of it online right now. People are taking pictures because you have the galaxy like this, but there would be a star, like see this one right there, but imagine that this galaxy had another one just like that appearance, but it would be in the spiral arm. A new one, wasn't there two weeks ago, now it's there. And what happened is a star blew up. And the interesting thing about stars that blow up is that the physics behind, the mechanism behind the blowing up part uh, typically results in a very well-known brightness. And it has to do with the initial mass of the stars and the kind of stars that can blow up and so on. So that if you measure the brightness of the explosion, that tells you how far away the object is because there is an expected brightness. And then you can just measure, you measure the apparent brightness and then you can infer how far away it is. But you wouldn't want to take that as the only measure. You could also measure uh, the galaxy in terms of its glow or its light or the stars that are within it and measure how far away it is. And then you can compare those two measures and see if they agree with one another. And they do. Uh, so there is in astronomy kind of a ladder, a way hierarchically to measure distances based on different kinds of astrophysical events and measures that tell you how far away something is. That's, that's basically the answer. Uh, some things that are very close, you can do literally ge geometrically to measure distances. But once you get far enough away, you're usually measuring some property of light that tells you uh, the distance that things are. Yeah, I just had a quick question regarding the color spectrum. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you gauge temperature from from that kind of distance? Yellow. Well, there, there's there's couple of things in the question. One part of the question is, if you recall, I showed you the nebula. The colors that you're seeing in the nebula are not a temperature in the same way that stars would be a color because of their temperature. So gases that are kind of floating around in a galaxy, they're being made to glow kind of like a neon light. Uh, they're being excited in some way. And so they're releasing photons of particular colors of light, red or blue or whatever it is. Uh, but that's not necessarily uh, in lockstep with the temperature. Stars, however, 
those are going to be what are called like black body objects. Those are objects that truly are uh, big balls of gas with uh, that have atoms that are moving at a particular velocity. They have they are at a particular temperature, and it is because of that energy, those motions, that they emit a particular spectrum of wavelengths of light that tells us their temperature. So with regards to stars, you can measure literally the spectrum and based on what is a called a black body uh, spectrum, you can infer how, uh, what their temperature is. There's one more part of the question though that's always inferred here, which is when you make these measurements in astronomy, you're going to have to make the assumption that the physics that we understand here locally is also being applied to something that is 100 million light years away. We don't have any evidence, astronomers don't have any evidence that is not true. Everything seems to make sense. It seems as though the physics of, you know, going on in this galaxy is the same physics of light and everything that we understand here locally. Uh, so that's also part of the, the answer is that you have to make that assumption that the physics is kind of the same everywhere. That's how you know. Any other questions? One more. This isn't a question, but I have a story about naming asteroids. Many years ago, I had the pleasure of teaching a course at Caltech on comets and asteroids with the shoemakers. Uh -huh. And the shoemakers provided sky pictures for the students to search through these pictures for asteroids. Well, the students were in pairs. And one pair found an asteroid. Oh, we get to name it. Well, they each had a girlfriend with a different name. And they decided to name it Mom. That was not accepted. Luckily, after a while, they found a second one. Yeah, they do have strict naming. You can't name it after your pet. There's some, there's some naming conventions that you have to abide by. It's true. Yeah. Shoemaker and Levy, that one was... So comets are a little different than oh. asteroids, yeah. Comets can be named after more than one person. Yeah. yeah. And after the discoverer. Um, I have one more question. If there is no other question. Um, if someone were to want to begin to do this sort of thing... Like, like astrophotography. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, what would be the first step? Oh, well, if you recall in the very beginning of my uh, presentation, I had the picture of the, you know, Orion just over the building. I think that's a great, or even these kind of nightscape, let me just stop here, the nightscape pictures. Uh, because all you really need, I mean, today, digital cameras are really sensitive. Uh, so a digital camera on a tripod, and you take 30-second uh, exposures in the dark, you need to be away from the city but you can do some really remarkable pictures and make them very beautiful like this. That's a great way to start because you have to work with the image. You, you know, what comes out of the camera isn't gonna necessarily look like this. There's still some manipulation that might be involved as well. You might learn that you, know, you need to take something called a dark frame that subtracts some of the noise. You wanna remove the little hot pixels. You can do all kinds of things to improve the data, if you will. So half the battle in astronomy is the acquisition of the information, which is to take the picture. You got to go out there and do it. And then the other half is, you know, working with that with some kind of software. It could be as simple as Photoshop. And then, of course, uh, astrophotographers like myself use very sophisticated uh, astronomical software specifically designed to work with this data to make these images. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Um, Adam, uh, our photography is photography in the normal sense that we would think of it as, say, 50 years ago, glass plates, that kind of thing, emulsions. Yeah. Is any of that being done today or is everything electronic, electronically processed uh, in some manner? So a couple of answers there. First is that, you know, that today, I don't, I think you'd be hard pressed to find many records 
albums, physical albums, right? But there are plenty of these audiophiles who still use records and they make special rooms that they sit in to listen to the records and so on. So there's always going to be still a group of people that still do film and glass plates, but it would be a very, very small group of people, a very specialized group of people. And I would even go further to add that some of the astronomical data that was taken, say, in the 70s and 80s when it was still using film, like the digitized sky survey, for example, was later digitized. So going one step further is that you have this film glass plates of the, you know, of the former time, former epoch, that later became digitized, even though in its original form was taken as film or glass plates. So I would have to say, yeah, I mean, 95% of what is done today is going to be some form of digital signal. Uh, the funny thing about film is, of course, that it's a medium that you expose it to light, but after a certain period of time, it just stops responding to light just because it's a chemical reaction. Uh, digital imagery isn't like that per se. It keeps responding to light until it just can't count anymore. And then you can just take another exposure. Yeah, yeah. Will there ever be a museum of these images? There are. Really? In fact, at the, uh, there was even an exhibit. This very talk that I gave, um, okay, I, I did a new version of this talk, but I gave a very similar talk back in 2015 uh, for the Center of Creative Photography at the University of Arizona. They had an exhibit that was called Astronomical, and the entire exhibit was old astronomical photography. Yeah, and it had all of the artifacts and things that used to be used in the day. So yes, uh, there is plenty of that. And we live here in a place where it literally still is in rooms and stuff. So if you go to Mount Lemmon, you can still see old equipment. If you go to the National Observatory, Kitt Peak, there are still the uh, photography labs, those little rooms that the astronomers would you know, develop their film in and do all of that. So it still exists. It's just uh, not used, right? Well, I know you and Michael would have more to talk about if talking about the, how techniques have evolved because he used to work in that field as well. Yeah. Well, Adam, this has been fascinating and we want to thank you so very much for coming. Thank you.